I will provide a summary of left coronary and right coronary engagement for general and new cardiology fellows. Please review my talks from last year's. They are more comprehensive, but this is meant to be a summarized and updated overview, overview of coronary engagement. The talk will be divided in three. One brief section regarding uh, catheters and catheter shapes and sizes. A second section regarding left coronary and third section regarding right coronary. First, catheters. The most commonly used catheter for left coronary engagement is the Jutkin's left catheter. It has two bends or curves, the primary curve and the secondary curve. The distance between those two curves is what we call the size of the Jutkin's left. It can be Jutkin's left three, four, five, six. It's the distance in centimeters. Most commonly, we use a Jutkin's left four from a femoral axis and Jutkin's left 3.5 from a radial axis. But we may use anywhere between, between three and six, depending on the size of the aorta. For the right coronary artery, we have the Jutkin's right, which also has a primary curve and the secondary curve. The difference is the secondary curve is very shallow for the right coronary artery. It is also sized depending on the distance between the primary and secondary curve, but almost always in all cases, we use a Jutkin's right four. Now let's take a particular patient for whom you need to engage the left coronary from a femoral axis and you use a JL4. What size catheter you need from a right radial axis? And here I want you to understand that image well to understand why we downsize from right radial. Right radial, look at when it comes the catheter through the innominate into the ascending aorta, because of that sharp bend here, the catheter gets elongated and points down. Therefore, if you use a JL4 from a right radial in that very same patient, the catheter will be pointing down, will not be able to engage. So from right radial, because of that elongation, you need to get a shorter catheter to aim in the same direction. So if you're using GL4 from femoral and that same patient, GL3.5 elongated, will be able to engage the coronary. Furthermore, I want you to understand that image very, very well. This is a general idea, regardless of what access you're using. Whenever you see a catheter elongated, and the tip of it pointing down below the left coronary, your immediate reflex should be, I need a shorter catheter. Conversely, if you see a catheter looped on itself and falling with its tip pointing up, your immediate reflex should be, I may need a longer arm catheter, okay? This is the ideal position of a catheter, like this. And this is a slide you need to memorize very well. I mean, I show this, all the time in the cath lab. I show the fellow a catheter like this. I tell him, what's the next step? You should always remember, elongated, pointed down, you get a shorter catheter, gel three and a half in this case. You have it falling down with a tip pointing up, you get a longer catheter, gel five. Now, left radial, all textbook used to say that from left radial, you do not need to downsize your catheter compared to femoral. In my experience, that's not true. Actually, from left radial, you do also elongate the catheter, and so the tip will tend to point down even from left radial. Maybe a little less than right radial, but it will point down and get elongated. So my preference from left radial is to do what I do with right radial, is to also downsize the Jutkin's left catheter by a half. And by the way, that's more advanced, but for guiding catheter, particularly the EBU type of guide catheter and the ICARI, I do not downsize compared to femoral, but that's a separate idea that I explained in another talk. So for diagnostic uh, radial catheter, we, I most commonly use the Jutkin system, left and right, but there are other catheters you need to be familiar with. There is a Tiger catheter, which is a little similar to the Jutkin's left. 
there is this major difference is that you have a larger secondary curve. You have a platform here that sits on the opposite aortic wall. So it sits better on the opposite aortic wall, makes it less likely to prolapse out of the ascending aorta and loop on itself. So this is the tiger. Same with the jackie. It's similar to tiger, except it has an extra bend of it at its tip. So tiger points a little up. Jackie can point a little more down. The main problem with those catheters is actually the size. So people who tell me they switch to Tiger or Jackie, they start having difficulty compared to Jutkins. It's not the design. The catheter design is great. The problem is the size. I wish they have Tiger 3.5. They don't. It's only available in 4 and 4.5. It's too big in most patients. So that's why I steer away from using it these days. Okay. The beauty of those catheters is that they can be used very much to engage also the right coronary artery, the same way you would use a Jopkins right, which I will explain a little later. Now, I explain how we downsize catheters for the left coronary from a radial axis by a half. How about for the right coronary? Interestingly, look at that picture. For the right coronary, that curvature from the innominate actually makes your catheter, when aiming to the right side of the aorta, they make them more loop, shortened, and upward looking, unlike pointing to the left side. So it will tend to point more up. Therefore, we don't downsize catheter to the RCA, okay? Because it's already pointing up. If anything, in the early days, it used to be recommended that from radial, you upsize your Jutkins right. You use Jutkins right five, but we rarely do that. But just know we don't downsize the Jutkins for the uh, right coronary artery. Another uh, important idea, basic idea, with, which is what view we use to engage. It's the LAO view, left anterior oblique. And this is a basic explanation. LAO is a view that spread out and opens the right versus the left cusp, and it makes you orthogonal to the ostia of the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. That's why LAO is also a view that's good for the ostia of those coronary uh, in, in geography. So it splays them out well, and in you, when you want to engage the left coronary, you make your catheter point in this direction. When you want to engage the right coronary, you make your catheter point in this direction just in front of you. If you do REO, you will have to make the catheter point at you to engage the right and point away from you to engage the left, but that's much more difficult to do. We like in angiography, which is 2D imaging, to do everything in an orthogonal fashion to the structure we're aiming at. A final idea in that first part is the amplats catheters. There is the amplats left and amplats right. The amplats catheters are catheters that are duck-shaped. Okay, they have a bend down, then a primary tip up. The difference between M plus left and M plus right is the size of this butt here. M plus right has a small butt. It can be used for right coronary engagement, whether M plus right one or two. M plus left has a very large butt, and that's what makes it special. It's a great catheter to engage the left coronary, but also the right coronary and the grafts. And it's one of the most supportive catheters. So for interventionists, it's an extremely important catheter for all interventions, for all coronary, not just left coronary, right and graft as well. Different sizing, one for right coronary and plus left, two for left coronary and vein graft. And plus right is a benign catheter that you may use instead of Jutkins right. Same maneuvering as Jutkins right, a little bit easier to maneuver than Jutkins right. Okay. So I will explain now left coronary engagement. So those are the steps. I summarize them in three steps, zero, one, two, and three. The first step is you need in your brain to imagine right cusp and left cusp. On fluoro, in LAO view, which spread up, spreads apart right versus left cusp, you need to always draw in your brain right and left cusp. It will come with experience. The right cusp is the lower cusp. It could be right or non-coronary. It's hard to distinguish in this view, but it's the right is the lowermost along with the non-coronary cusp. The left cusp 
is the higher cusp, okay? Non-coronary cusp is posterior, right coronary cusp is anterior, but both are low, okay? So you have to draw those in your brain. And when we're going transradially, your wire will almost always fall into the right cusp or non-coronary cusp, into that lower cusp. And that's what I call the base of operation. You should always start your procedure with the wire falling into that right or non-coronary cusp. That's how you start everything. That's why I call this ground zero, okay? That's your start. Now, after you get your wire there, looped, and you make it loop on that cusp, then you advance, and I'm talking left coronary engagement, so I'm advancing Jutkin's left or Tiger, let's say, catheter. Now you advance it. This may be passive advancement where you just push it through. However, frequently, especially if you have a sharp angulation here in the innominate aorta, don't just shove it down. You need to finesse it. Ask the patient to take a deep breath to elongate that aorta and attenuate that angle here and do a slight clock torque. So don't just shove it down. Make advance it in a way that it eventually looks toward the left once it reaches that right cusp. So this is an illustration of a case where, for example, the fellow here just shoved it down. Look. And look, it looped on itself. If you just shove it down over the wire, the catheter looped on itself and pulled up the wire. And when this happens, when it loops on itself because you shoved it down, what you do, don't just re-advance the wire. The wire will keep going back up into the innominate. Don't re-advance the wire. You pull the catheter and re-advance the wire. This way, the catheter will not make your wire point into the uh, innominate and arch, okay? So mild clock torque and deep breath. Now, the second step is to jump, and that's the most critical and maybe most difficult step. Once your catheter is on that right cusp, you make a jump to the left. And while I'm maneuvering here, I'm keeping the wire in the catheter. That will provide me with more stiffness, but also will provide me with bailout. Should that catheter jump out or loop on itself, like I showed here, well, I re-advance the wire and start over, okay? So I keep the wire in and I jump from right to left cusp. Now, before you jump, make your catheter a little bit flat. You know, if it is looking at you in an LAO view, try to flatten it, oftentimes with a clock door. So you flatten that catheter, rather than looking like this, you make it look like that with a slight clock, then you pull to make it jump to the left cusp, okay? And here I have an illustration of what I call flattening. Watch here, you see how we clocked and we flattened it. It wasn't looking nice, we flattened it, okay? After you flatten it, you just pull. You don't need to do any talk, you just pull. However, there is a critical point here. As you're pulling, you may see your catheter is about to fly up. As you're pulling, your catheter may start looking the other way, may start wanting to loop on itself. So whenever this happens, you have a fraction of a second to react. You need to immediately push back your catheter down before you lose it, give it a torque in any direction, more commonly clockwise torque, then try again to pull. If your catheter is flying back again, again, immediately react, push it back down, maybe counter clock this time and pull again to jump to the left cusp, okay? So the key idea is be ready to re-advance plus torque if it is about to fly out. You only have a fraction of a second and that comes with experience to react quickly. Now, interestingly, deep breath, amazing. It works very well for that jump. And I'll show a picture of why that is. It elongates this, it even elongates the right and left cusp, it makes them more at the same level, it makes that jump actually easier. So deep breath helps very much with the jump. And here are some illustration. This is the patient where initially the fellow I said, shoved the catheter down and looped it, but now we did it with deep breath and a slight clockwise torque and look how nice it became. Okay, watch it again. Deep breath, which elongated that aorta, and he clocked it a little bit, and it came down to the right cusp now, looking in the proper direction. 
then all you have to do is to make it jump. This is an illustration of the jump. You know, how do you know you jumped? You will see that abrupt motion. Watch it again. Okay, that's how you know you jumped. It's not always easy to recognize I'm in the right cusp, left cusp, particularly if you don't have enough experience. So what you can do when you're not sure, am I in the right cusp? Have I jumped already? If you've already taken your wire out, you can give a puff. The disadvantage is you have to have your wire out. And I like to keep my, my wire until I'm close to the left coronary, whether engaged or close to engaged. But if you don't have your wire in or you think you've already jumped and you can give a puff to see where you are and memorize that image well, this puff, whenever it shows you this, you see here this ridge that tells you you're in the right cusp and this is the ridge between the right and left cusp. If you are in the left cusp, you will see the coronary. You will see contrast spilling in the left coronary. So when you see that image with a ridge here, with no coronary, you're still in the right cusp. You haven't jumped. This is another case. Here I'm showing you how the catheter is going down nicely with deep breath and slight clock torque. Now, what causes a radial case to be difficult and how does deep breath help? The most difficult radial case is this, two features. You have a sharp angle between the innominate and the ascending aorta, and you have a short ascending aorta. Okay, that doesn't give you room to maneuver, doesn't give you a long platform for you to be stable enough and jump from one cusp to the other. That double combo makes it very difficult. So deep breath, it elongates. So you go from something like that, to something like this, the aorta becomes longer and the angle here becomes less sharp. So it makes it easy to advance your devices and make them look toward the left side, okay? Deep breath, interestingly, also helps with the jump. So much so that as you're advancing the catheter with deep breath, you may not need even to go to the right cusp. It may jump directly onto the left cusp. So I described the zero, one, two steps, okay? And particularly the jump. Now, after you jump, how do you get in the coronary? In a lot of cases, once you jump, you jump straight into the left coronary, particularly with a properly sized catheter, like a Judkins left 3.5. But frequently you don't, you come below the coronary. Now, how to maneuver the catheter from below the coronary all the way into the coronary? There are two techniques, what I call the 3A for step 3A, which is you pull it and you're engaging from above, and 3B where you push the catheter to engage it from below. And those ideas apply to diagnostic catheters, whether the Judkins or the Tiger or Jackie system. They also apply to guiding catheters. For guiding catheter, I carry, you can use either one, preferably the 3B. For the EBU CLS guiding catheter, you have to use a 3B from below. The jump from above does not work. But for diagnostic catheter, either techniques, either one of those techniques would work. So the way we do it, from above, you just pull the catheter and frequently it will get right in. If it doesn't get in, you may try again with pull with a slight torque, frequently clockwise torque. However, the most important thing, there is no general rule as far as torque. So if you pull it and it doesn't get in, you try to get it back down again and pull with a torque. If clock didn't work and your catheter is about to fly out, immediately reverse your torque and counter clock. The single most important idea here is to be ready to reverse your talk. There is no rule as far you should clock or counter clock, okay? For most of the prior steps I described here, clock is the one that works, including for that. But again, be ready to react what you see and reverse. What I say actually, if you're pulling with a clock to engage, do a test, do like a 10 to 20 degree torque and see how the catheter is behaving. If you see your catheter going in another direction, immediately reverse. Conversely, if you see your catheter going in the proper direction, but it hasn't reached, 
the left coronary arrest, you can actually keep talking more than 20 degrees. You may need to talk 30, 50 degrees, okay? So the first 10, 20 degree, make them a test and see how the catheter is behaving. If you engage from below, you just push the catheter. From the left cusp, you push the catheter till it engages from below. And it may go straight in, or if it is coming out of plane, you pull it back, you give it a torque. It could be clock or counter clock, and you push it again. Okay, And you keep trying to pull and try over if you haven't engaged. This technique, the engaging from below technique, is more useful in those cases where you have difficult engagement, where the catheter has a propensity to fly out. It provides with a more stable engagement to put the catheter from below, support it on the opposite aorta, but also on the aortic valve. It's less likely to fly out each time the patient takes a breath. So in difficult cases, I do favor engaging from below. In simple cases, Either one is fine. And like I said, for guiding catheter EBU CLS, it is engagement from below. I will give you this case now. So this is a patient. Uh, we're using JL 3.5 to engage the left coronary. Imagine this is it, the blue catheter. This is how we came in initially. So we jumped from right to left cusp, and the catheter is coming like this. How do you engage that coronary? So one technique is to push and loop it from below. Okay, what else? Second idea is that you can pull with a clockwise torque. Now frequently clock makes the catheter point up. So pulling with a clock may work. If it doesn't work or if you see your catheter flying out, you may push it back down and try again to pull with a counter clock. What else can work here? An idea I mentioned earlier, Look at that catheter, how it looks. So what's another technique that works here? Whenever you see a catheter looking like this, this is the single most important slide maybe in the whole talk. So your catheter is elongated and pointing, the tip is pointing down, you get a shorter catheter. So for this patient, the immediate next reflex, you have to try to maneuver it to engage. But keep on the back of your mind, if I fail, I should get a shorter catheter. So I'm going to summarize again all the techniques we can use here. One technique that you save for last is to get a shorter catheter, JL3. A second technique is to try to push to engage from below. And this is what we did here. We push to engage from below. However, when you push to engage from below, I don't like that shape. You don't want to be engaged this way. One, you risk dissecting the left main coronary during your contrast injection that is so eccentric. Two, you're not going to fill your coronary well during your coronary angiography. So after you do it, engage it from below like this. If it is that eccentric, pull a little bit on it. Make it a little more coaxial doesn't have to be fully coaxial, but a little more coaxial, a 45 degree angle. Okay, so that's the second technique to push from below. The third technique is to try to pull the catheter with a clockwise torque. And the fourth technique is to do deep inspiration. That's the technique that works very, very well. It doesn't just work to get you down to the right cusp or to make you jump from right to left. It works very well to get you from the left cusp into the left coronary. And I will explain why. So this is what you do when you take a deep breath, you elongate all this, you know, it makes it easy for you to go down and to jump right to left. This picture actually shows it well, why the catheter will have more propensity to jump to the left when you take a deep breath versus falling onto the path of least resistance on the right cusp. But also it makes you engage the coronary because here's what happens. Let's say this catheter is pointing down below the left coronary. Well, when you take a deep breath, the left main will get pulled down with the elongation of the aorta. So much so that it will get pulled down to the level of that Jutkin's left. And now the Jutkin's left can jump right in. However, keep one idea in mind, when you take a deep breath, Initially, the catheter may jump up 
okay, taking a deep breath will pull the catheter up. So whenever he takes a deep breath, you have to be ready to advance. Don't take a deep breath. You see the chest expanding on your X-ray and just push the catheter in. Sometimes you may need to push with a torque. I think initially I'll try to push with not much torque or with a slight clockwise torque, and it will go right in. And this is uh, an illustration of a case I did yesterday, where here the catheter was coming below the coronary, okay? So what we did with a deep breath, you can see elongation of the chest, and it jumped right in. This is just with deep breath, deep breath and a push. But notice that with deep breath, the catheter was flying up. So you have to be ready to advance. Otherwise, it have kept fly flying up. This is another illustration of a deep breath. Again, the catheter was pointing down below the coronary. The coronary is here and it's elongated. It's very similar to the case I showed earlier. So you can think I may need a Judkins F3 as last resort. We tried to clock and pull, it didn't work. We pushed, it didn't work. So we tried deep breath, which we probably should have tried at the beginning. And here with deep breath, see, and it went right in. Now notice that with deep breath, the catheter was about to fly out. You immediately react, you have a fraction of a second. We reacted with a clockwise torque and push, especially push, because again, deep breath can make you fly up. So push and clockwise torque, and it went right in. So remember those four steps very much. That's a very common instance. The catheter, as you jump from the right cusp, comes below the coronary. Those are the four steps, okay? Last resort, shorten the catheter, but better engage from above by pulling with clock, engage from above with inspiration, or push to engage from below with the same catheter. Question, when do I remove the O35 inch wire during left coronary engagement? Very good point. I remove the wire while, when I'm engaging, when I'm close to the coronary. So definitely after I have jumped. So I wait till I have jumped for sure. And then after I jump, I try to engage it and I can tell without puffs that I have engaged. The catheter tip behavior change. It stops moving with the aorta. It starts moving with the heart. It's a different motion on the catheter tip. It comes with experience, but I can tell that I'm the coronary or at the very least, if you're not very experienced, you can tell that I'm close to the human. This is when I take my wire out. But definitely after I have jumped into the left cusp. And by that time, I've already given my 50 units per kilogram heparin, which I use routinely in radial access. That will reduce the chance of clotting. A wire has much more chance of thrombosis than a catheter. So we don't like to keep wires in catheters and in the body for more than three minutes at a time, if you can. This is another case here. So this is a case where we're trying to engage, we're pushing from below and see how we're pushing the 3B technique. It went up and the catheter came up to the level of the left coronary. The only problem, it came to the side of that left coronary. Imagine this is left coronary, it came here a little more anterior, okay? So what do we do in this case? And I can tell we weren't engaged. The catheter tip wasn't locked. Like I said, you can tell with experience that the catheter tip got locked. This is how you know you're engaged. So what do you do in this case? You start over. You pull. You give the catheter a torque, either direction. And then you push again, hoping that with your torque, your catheter now will come in a different orientation. I want to show you that critical point I talk about. This is a Jackie catheter, and the patient has a sharp innominate aorta angulation. And this is a Jackie 4. The size of the catheter is 4. So see here, we're trying to jump. And watch this. The catheter is about to fly out. That's what I call the critical point. You have a fraction of a second to react. So we react. As we start flying out, we pushed it back in with a slight torque and it actually jumped into the left cusp. Because the patient had bad innominate aortic angulation, like I said, I prefer to start with a 3B in this technique. 
to push it from below, especially that this is a larger catheter here. And it worked. We pushed it from below and see, it got right in, okay? Here I'm showing you a picture again of that critical point. You see it flying out, you push it back down, and you do slight torque. If you had done clock around along the way during this maneuvering, you immediately reverse it. This is actually a simple case. Look at the catheter. It's coming just below the coronary. So we pulled with a slight clock, and you see it jumped right in. And when it jumps in, you almost see the behavior changes. It becomes locked, the catheter. The catheter tip becomes locked. Anyway, this shows you how clock torque makes the catheter tip point up. It's one of those four techniques I use when the catheter is looking below the coronary. This is a case of sharp innominate aorta angulation. And I'll show you here how we tried all the techniques to be able to engage. So we start here, we're on the right cusp. And at one point we jumped, here we jumped. At the very beginning, you can see that the catheter jumped. So we got to the left cusp, we have the wire in. So I tried to engage by pushing from below because again, sharp innominate aorta, that's my preferred technique. So we pushed from below, we kept pushing. Unfortunately, the catheter did not engage. So no, no problem. We pulled it back, gave it a torque, and pushed it again. And you'll see here, pulled it back, gave it a torque, and pushed it again. But it did not engage either. So what we did, we went back to trying to engage from above, and it worked. So we tried several times to engage from below, as we show here. It didn't work. Then we eventually decided to Okay, try to engage from above. So you can switch back and forth between 3B and 3A. And one important thing that happens, a lot of time you try from above, it doesn't work. Then you try from below multiple times. As you're trying from below, that catheter can get reshaped. The tip of it can become more up pointing. So much so that the 3A engaging from above now will work. But know all the arsenal of techniques so you can switch back and forth. I will just describe briefly here another common situation we encounter is a separate LED left circumflex ostia or a short left main, wherein your catheter goes selectively in one of the coronaries. So let's say I have a Jotkins left 3.5 and it's going selectively into the left circumflex. How do I make that catheter go into the LED? What I do in those cases, I do my in geographic view for the left circumflex, RAO caudal, LAO caudal. I finish my circumflex selectively, then I decide to engage the LAD and do my LAD selectively. How to get from the circ to the LAD? So one idea is change the catheter. If your catheter is a left circumflex, you want to point it in the LAD, how do you change the catheter size? Smaller catheter. Why? Because the LAD is more superior compared to the left circumflex. So you need a catheter pointing more up. So JL3 and a half, I use a JL3 and it will point me toward the LAD. So that's one te universal technique. But there are other techniques. One technique is you pull from the circ, you get out of the coronary, then you push down to the cusp and you try to engage from below. Engaging from below, the 3B technique, will make your catheter point up and it will engage more likely the LAD. So that's a second technique. Then we have five techniques in total. So the first two techniques are clear. The third technique is more difficult, but that's one I use frequently, is I disengage and I don't go to the 3B technique. I still try to engage directly from above, but I give the catheter torque that will make it point to the LED. Now this is complex. Clockwise torque can work because it points the catheter frequently up, but counter clock can also work. And it depends how the catheter is sitting on the aorta. If it has a hinge on the aorta, counter clock may make your catheter look more anterior. There is no general rule. What I do, I disengage, I give it, a counterclock initially and re-advance. 
it goes in, great. If it doesn't, I pull back, disengage, give it a clock, and reattempt. Most important thing, as you're disengaging and you're doing a torque, be careful, your catheter may fly out. So be ready to reverse that torque if your catheter is flying out. The fourth technique is deep inspiration, and I will explain it. And the fifth and last resort technique is amplitude left two. Amplitude left that I showed earlier, the catheter with a big butt, it tends to point up. So it makes it easier to point in the LED. The large amplitude left two, the larger the amplitude left, the more it points up. It's unlike the Judkins. Judkins, the larger it is, the more it points down. With an amplitude left, the larger it is, the larger that butt is, the more that tip will point out. So I can use amplitude left two to get on the LED, amplitude left one to get on the circumflex. So those are the five techniques. And I will show you how inspiration works. Same thing. Inspiration will pull your whole LED left circumflex system down. So if your catheter is in the circumflex, disengage, then ask the patient to take a deep breath and push back the catheter. The deep breath will pull the LED down so that the catheter now that was going the circ at that same level now will go into the LED as that picture shows, okay? Now to go from LA, LAD to left circumflex, it's the same thing, but in reverse, you get a larger catheter. You can, if you engage from below, you try to engage from above to point to the circumflex. And you can do deep exhalation instead of deep inspiration. So we ask the patient to exhale and hold his breath after exhalation. You disengage and you engage as he's holding his breath, breath in exhalation. I'm going to talk now about right coronary engagement. So right coronary engagement from a radial axis is easier frequently than left coronary engagement. And here is how we engage. The initial steps are the same. The ground zero basal operation, a wire looped over the right cusp. You advance the Jutkin's right or Amplat's right, one to two in size, over that wire again, use finesse, you make clock torque and deep breath because you still want that catheter to be looking this way, looking toward the left before you start maneuvering, okay? It's easier to advance the Judkins right than Judkins left because it's not as sharp. So it's less likely to loop on itself or prolapse out as you're advancing. So shoving it may work, but I still don't suggest shoving. So once you get to the valve, you, luckily, you usually will fall onto the right cusp. Now you don't need to jump. From the right cusp, you need to engage that coronary with a special maneuvering. For the right uh, coronary engagement, I do take the wire up because you have less propensity of, of flying out in the aorta. And if you do fly a little up, it's easy to push the catheter back down to the right cusp. The key idea is for right coronary engagement is to have your catheter touch the valve. This is how you know where you are. Remember, it's all abstract. You're not seeing the actual valve. Or how, how do you know where the valve is? You have to touch it with your catheter, feel that resistance. Always start at that point, And this way, you know how much I need to pull to get in the right coronary. The right coronary is about one to one and a half centimeter above the right cusp. That gives you an idea. It's not much higher than the right cusp. The way we do it, with your catheter pointing to the left, you pull with a clockwise torque, 90 to 180 degree clockwise torque. It has to be a synchronized motion. You pull as you're clocking. As fellows know, you cannot clock in place. You clock in place, the torque does not get transmitted through the tortuosity. So you have to move as you're torquing, as a general rule. And here you pull with a clockwise torque. And this is how we do it normally. We use a clockwise torque with both hands, the back hand, which is on typically a rotating stopcock and the front hand. And you pull with both hand as your clockwise torque. An important idea, radial versus femoral for the RCA. Interestingly, 
while for the left, femoral is a whole lot easier than radial. With femoral, your Judkins left four frequently just jumps in. You don't need to distinguish zero, one, two, three steps. But for the right, the femoral tend to be more difficult for right engagement than uh, the radial. So, so for a radial axis, you pull with a clockwise torque. For a femoral axis, the same thing. You pull with a clockwise torque, the same 90 to 180 degree. The difference is though, from a femoral, the catheter tends to dive down. So you pull the clock torque and the catheter will dive down back to the cusp. So you have to pull a lot more than you do from radial. From radial, your pull gets transmit, transmitted easier than your pull from femoral. So from radial, you pull a lot less than you pull from femoral. So from femoral, you tend to dive with your Judkins right for. From radial, you tend to fly up. This is an illustration of how you, know, you pull with a clockwise torque. So you touch the valve, then you pull with a clock and you get right in. Like here, if I look at this fluoro image, it's hard for me to tell where is the valve. That's why we start by touching it. This is where it is. I'm touching it. Then we pull with a clockwise torque. And it's one to one and a half centimeters. Now, this is the most important slide for the RCA talk. Five caveat in general RCA engagement. So whenever you try that technique, you pull with a clock and you don't get in the right coronary, there are five ideas that should come to your mind. One, the catheter tip is too low. It came too low after torque, particularly with femoral. Or the catheter tip came too high. Or the catheter is in the left cusp. And that's one idea that is very difficult for fellow to recognize. As you're torquing it, especially in patients whose aorta is vertical, which makes it easy to engage the left. But in those patients, the catheter tends to jump in the left cusp as you're torquing it to engage the right coronary. And the fellow doesn't recognize it. But what happens if your catheter is in the left cusp, look at those cusps. The left cusp is higher than the right cusp. So if you're starting from the left cusp, by definition, your catheter will reach way up. So you need to recognize your left cusp and get it back down to the right cusp. And I will explain how to do it. Another caveat, the fourth caveat is, well, I keep trying, I can't engage it. I On my puffs, I don't even see the coronary. Well, think that coronary is not coming from the right side of the aorta is coming from the anterior side of the right cusp. And I will explain that. The last tip is elongated horizontal aorta. I'll explain all those. And one other caveat, I'll call it the sixth caveat, is that the JR4 keeps flying. You engage, but the patient takes a breath. The JR4 is a very unstable catheter, it flies out. So I recommend for fellows to, once you engage, push it in. Another, uh, problem that can happen is you engage, but you've over torqued that catheter. So once you engage, you don't just transmit 180 degree, you've already over torqued that catheter. So you transmit 360 degree and the catheter it, it reverses to its original shape. So I will start with, uh, I will dissect each one of those five problems. So how do you know you are too low or too high relative to the RCA? So again, RCA is on top of the coronary sinus of Valsalva. This is the coronary sinus, that nest, and this is the tubular aorta. It's really around that junction, about 1.5 centimeter above the right cusp. So if you do a non-selective puff and you see a nest, that means you are too low. You are in the sinus, so you are too low. If you see convexity or a straight line, you're in that tubular aorta, you're too high. So that's how you can tell on your puffs, am I too low or am I too high, okay? So if you come too low, what do you do? Simple, don't just pull it up. A reflex of fellows, when we give a puff, we're too low, they just pull it up. Almost never works. You pull it up, it jumps all the way into the tubular aorta. You have to finesse it. So the way you do, you counter clock slightly, then you pull, then you clock, slight clock, okay? That's how it works. And once you slightly clock to prevent it from flying, I push it in, okay? Now, if you come too high, what do you do? You reverse your torque, you counter clock, 
you push it down all the way to the right cusp, then you start over with less pull than last time. Don't just try to push it down while it's looking like this. Generally, if a catheter is looking like this, you push it down, you'll scrape the aorta one, and two, it will loop on itself. And it's not going to get down. So you counterclock it to make it look straight at you, make it free. Then you push it down to the cusp. Then you pull with a slight clock, less pull this time. <laughs> And this is an illustration of a case. So the fellow is trying to engage and he's not able to. So we gave a puff. Why isn't he able to engage? What's the problem? So you are on the left cusp. That's why you couldn't engage. And you see the ridge here medially. Now, more easily, you typically see the left coronary. When, you in, when you're in the left cusp, you give a puff, you will see the left coronary. And you'll see a ridge on the other side. That ridge would be between the left and the right cusp. When you're on the right cusp and you inject, you'll see a ridge here and you'll see a coronary on this side. That's how you know you're on the right cusp. You see coronary here and a ridge on this side. Left cusp, you see a ridge here and a coronary on that side. So we were in the left cusp here. So how do we do to get to the right cusp? This is a standard technique I use. You have to torque the catheter. Usually I counterclock to make it look like this, to make it look in this direction. Frequently the catheter is looking this way. So I counterclock to make it look in this direction. Then I push it down. And once I push it down, I clock to engage. You can clock and pull up and push it down. But the reason I don't clock is that I want to clock once I get to the coronary. You don't want to have overclock that catheter. So I start with counter clock, pull up to free it from that cusp, push it back down, then clock to engage the coronary. And the key once you get down is to keep it low. Don't pull much. Those are cases where I pull very little. I clock and I pull a lot less than I pull normally. Keep it low so you don't jump back into that left cusp. So I talked about the first three caveats. Now I'm going to talk about the fourth caveat. If you keep trying to engage and you fail and you're in the right cusp, you give puffs, you don't see that coronary. You have to think that right coronary is probably not coming from the right side of the right cusp. It's rather coming from the anterior wall of the right cusp. So when you're doing LAO, it's, you're not orthogonal to the takeoff. The takeoff is looking at you. So the best way in that case is to follow two advices. One, you have to make your catheter point at you in an LAO view, or use an REO and make the catheter point in that direction with the anterior aorta. So that's one. Two, your Judkins right in those cases doesn't work. Judkins right has a short tip. For it to reach the coronary, it has to be fully clocked and elongated, eccentric. When it becomes eccentric, it becomes elongated and it engages. But if you're centered in a neutral position, it doesn't reach the coronary. So GR4 doesn't work for anterior takeoff. So what you do in those cases, you try to make your catheter look at you, but you try to use another catheter, especially in patients with slightly enlarged aorta. Do you try to use Classically, the amplets left one catheter, that big butt catheter that has a long reach. Amplets left one catheter. You can use AR2, amplets right two. It may work in small aorta as well. Okay, so that's the fourth caveat. And this is an illustration of this. This is a case where we engage in an audio view, use an amplets left one catheter and we aim the catheter anteriorly in REO view. The problem when I use REO view is I wouldn't know, am I in the right or left cusp? Sometimes as I'm maneuvering in the REO view, as I'm maneuvering in the REO view, my catheter may jump to the left and I wouldn't know, and I will aim my catheter anteriorly, but I'm in the left cusp. So I frequently with time now, I've learned to rather use LAO view make sure I'm in the right cast and make the catheter AL point at me. If needed, I use briefly the REO, make sure it's pointing anterior, okay? So two steps, REO or 
on tip toward your nario and al1 or occasionally ar you think of that after the first three pitfalls fail and when on non selective puffs you don't see any coronary coming have one last caveat which is the elongated aorta you have to imagine the shape of the aorta in every patient you work on especially older patient or patient with an enlarged aorta for example on echo their aorta is four centimeter or more whether at the sinuses or at the tubular level and the way you can tell the shape of the aorta invasively is by the shape of your catheter. It's not that we're doing aortic angiogram, but the way the catheter is coming down tells you how that aorta is. Because when you have an elongated, enlarged, and horizontal aorta, it is horizontal, meaning the coronary is still one and a half centimeter above the cusp. But on a vertical level, it's at the same level as the cusp. So if you try to engage it pointing here in this elderly patient like you would do in a younger one. If you point here, you're like 10 centimeters above the coronary. And I've seen people keep trying, trying to engage at this level. Well, you're way off. Again, base of operations, start at the cusp and know your coronary is not much higher and use the shape of the catheter to tell you, well, my aorta is horizontal. I should keep my catheter low and point it down to engage that coronary, okay? And this is an illustration of a patient with aorta of about uh, 4.5 to 5 centimeters. You did an aortogram, look how the aorta is. And the coronary is coming here. So you should shoot for it here when you engage it. And this is how I engage it. We use an M plus right two. We made it point down, look how it's pointing, okay? And the way I could tell, you didn't need that aortogram. Look at the way the catheter is shaped when it's sitting on the valve. It's not shaped like this, like in other cases I've shown. It's shaped in a kind of straight line. Here, it's shaped in a horizontal fashion. So you make it aim here. This is another illustration of such a case. Here, the fellow was trying to engage up. Well, he's way, way up. So we put it and we try to engage down. And again, the way you know you're up in general, not just in enlarged aorta, on your non-selective puff, you see a nest, like a round nest. This is a cusp. You see a convexity or a straight line. This is a tubular aorta, you're too high. It's the same distance from the aortic valve, but it's more horizontal rather than vertical distance. You can use, it depends on the aortic size. Jotkin's right may work frequently. It doesn't work. It doesn't reach. Uh, so I use AR2 or AL1. The problem with the AL, if the coronary is pointing that much down, is that AL tends to point up. I mentioned earlier, we use AL2, for example, to engage LAD. AL tends to point up as a catheter. So it may ha be hard with AL. Frequently, it's an AR2 for those cases. But you can use AL if you're good at it. So I'm going to show you a case that illustrates several pitfalls. So here we're trying to engage the right coronary. And you can see on non-selective puff, we're actually in the left cusp. You see, you see the left coronary. The image here is blurry. It's easier seen live. So we're in the left cusp. So what we did, we counter clock and push that catheter down to fall onto the right cusp. Okay. Now, once we got to the right cusp, we pulled with a clock. Watch it here. Okay, watch that puff. You don't need to inject a lot. This puff, you see convexity. You don't see a nest. So you're in the tubular IOP. That means you're too high. Okay, so what we do, we counter clock and push back down. So this, you see that? Memorize that image. You need to be very familiar with that image. That that tubular aorta. So we counterclocked, pushed back down, and pull with very little pull, much less pull. Why? Because pulling a little too much here will, one, make you jump in the left cusp, which was an issue in this case, or two, will make you jump high, which was an issue also in that case. So we clock 
with a pull, little pull, and to transmit your torque here, what you can do, you can shake the catheter at the valve. You can push and pull, push and pull slightly to transmit your torque while keeping your catheter low. So you have to move it to transmit your torque, but keep it low. And we successfully engaged. Here you see the successful engagements. See how we kept it low? We kept it low. We kept even not just pulling at one point, we were pushing. Question, how about the catheter falling in the non-coronary cusp? In cases where you keep struggling with, with the engagement, it is possible that you're in the non-coronary cusp. If you, you go through all those steps and it's still not working, it's possible you're not coronary cusp. And the way you can tell that is an REO image. You inject an REO. In an REO image, you will see on one side the left and right cusp overlap, and on the other side, the non coronary cusp. Okay, mm -hmm. so you would see on an REO image, you will see a ridge here and an aortic wall there. And this is how you know you're not coronary cusp. In that case, you can pull up and push it down, aiming in this direction. Then you go back to LAO to make sure you're on the right, not the left cusp. Question, how about bicuspid aortic valve? Patient with bicuspid valve, 80% are right and left cusp fusion. So the only cases where in left coronary engagement, you don't see a jump between right and left is bicuspid because there is no ridge. It's one cusp, okay? About 20% are right and non-coronary fusion. Question, how about the RCA coming from the left coronary cusp? So there is six and seventh pitfall that I did not mention on my list here. No. The sixth pitfall is falling in the non-coronary cusp. The seventh pitfall is actually your right coronary arises from the left cusp. Now I have a separate talk on that, how to engage it. But the idea in this, if you're, if you've tried all those techniques, including aiming for an anterior RCA and you still cannot engage the right, this is a case where you should actually try to do a non-selective contrast injection in the left cusp and see if the right coronary is arising from the left cusp. So after you exhaust all those techniques, you think of RCA arising from the left cusp. Frequently and unfortunately, it's not very close to the left coronary, meaning on your left coronary injection, you may not see anything related to the RCA. So you have to think about it only after you fail to engage right coronary using all those pitfalls. And engaging right coronary arising from the left is difficult. I have a special talk for this, but it's a frequently either a Jutkin's left or an amplitz left, not a JR for sure.